Checks out in Revelations Why you keep up your life Makes no sense to me They may be a throne in heaven And I've been tell for the company Hi and welcome to Ounce of Prevention. Today my guest is Dr. Sarah McCauley. Thank you, Sarah, so much for being on Ounce of Prevention. You're welcome. Now, the obvious question, and I, I know that this is going to come, um, the focus of Ounce of Prevention is on people who have inspiring lived experience stories. And I'm not going to ask you those types of questions today. The reason Sarah McCauley is on this show is because um, a number of months ago, I had the pleasure of talking to Sarah about grief and stillbirth and infertility and how grief can sometimes mask itself and be misdiagnosed. Um, and I thought, that that was something that I I was fascinated and it, it really um, did a lot for me. So I'm really glad to have you on the show to talk about those particular things. That is your area of expertise. Yeah. So Sarah, you were, um, for a number of years, uh, you were a grief counselor. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what, um, what was the most surprising thing in that job? Mm -hmm. One of the things I discovered that was surprising, or in hindsight not all that surprising, is that what we think of as being grief can actually be a very normal grief. It can be what we expect with tearfulness sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, frustration, lack of motivation, lack of hope, mm -hmm. sense that things are never going to get better. Um, but sometimes that can also look more like what people think of as being anxiety mm -hmm. or anger or maybe even someone being out of control, uh, behavioral problems, disorders, deviant behavior, uh, depression, mood disorder. It can even look so unusual that um, sometimes grief can come across as being like some sort of cognitive disruption, uh, maybe even like an Alzheimer's-like symptom like dementia. Wow. Yeah. So it seems like, especially here in Newfoundland, years ago, you'd hear stories like, you know, after Ethel died, you know, Frank just, you know, walked out into the ocean or Frank stopped working or Frank wouldn't eat. or Those seems seem to be, before our connected social media world, people were allowed time to lose it for a little while. And that seems to be more now, there's a time limit almost placed on grief where, hmm. are you still talking about that thing? Like, aren't <laughs> you over that? Don't you? Personally, didn't you have another baby? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you enlighten us I on the time limits of grief? And <laughs> <laughs> so there aren't actually time limits to it, but you're right. I think socially people do expect that after a certain amount of time, and maybe they think that's two hours, and maybe they think it's two weeks, two days, mm -hmm. two years. Um, they think you should somehow just be over it, and that means uh, you've forgotten about it. You maybe you have this traumatic resilience or traumatic growth, and you're actually a better person for it. Mm. Uh, but in reality, what we know is it's much more of a roller coaster, and you're definitely not over it in two days or two weeks. Now, some people just aren't going to have as strong a grief reaction as other people, and that might be because the situation was different. It might be because of their own personality and temperament. Mm. It might be because of the supports that they have and their coping strategies. Right. We never really know. But um, generally speaking, grief usually lasts a lot longer than when we think it will. So all of those helpful or intendedly helpful platitudes like, you know, um, it's probably better this way, um, it's time to move on, uh, they're there, it, it will be better. Um, even things like, um, you know, they're in a better place, that stuff usually isn't helpful to hear. Those are the kind of things that you individually or personally might be able to come to eventually. Yeah. But having someone yeah. else say it to you can feel prescriptive. Absolutely. It feels like it's a judgment call. It feels like people are telling you, in fact, they're enforcing on you their limit to your right. grief. So right. they're saying, okay, you've now crossed a line where this is no longer normal, definitely not socially acceptable, and right. now you're making me uncomfortable, so you got to at least fake like you're better. You mentioned uncomfortable. What, what do you think, as a psychologist, what is it about hearing somebody else's grief that makes people so uncomfortable? Hmm. Well... I guess um, I, I don't have anything sort of researchy or scientific to say around that, but personally, and, and I guess anecdotally, I think most people are more used to handling positive emotions, mm -hmm. uh, slight frustration, uh, maybe some annoyance and irritation, but we're not really comfortable 
maybe because we're not very familiar, dealing with sadness, with grief, with loss, we quickly want to have a solution for everyone. Right. And if we don't, we feel like we don't have anything to contribute. So maybe that's sort of the one pill fits all. Maybe it's the idea that we must be doing something. Maybe it's a sense of responsibility for other people that mm-hmm. sort of takes over. I think a lot of us want to be the expert in a situation and we want to feel like we have control over it. Right. So knowing the right thing to say seems like something you can strive for. Right. It seems possible. Right. So someone mentioned to me one day um, that when you speak to a family member, I mean, when your heart is broken, um, that family members want you to feel better in the moment, but that when you can reach out to a therapist, they have a better, um, they, they'll give you techniques to grieve in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you reach out to people who are close to you, they want you to feel better in the moment. They want you to, mm-hmm. I don't want you to leave this house feeling bad. Here's some tea. You're better now, right? You're not mm-hmm. going to come back next week. And, and even if you did go back a bunch of times, it's to fix it in the moment. And therapy seems to be more inclined and more geared towards coping for the long term. It's a big life change when somebody, especially with grief, w- with loss, mm-hmm. your life is drastically different. So, what do people? What someone that doesn't have someone that lives in a remote part of Newfoundland, for example, that doesn't have access yeah. to a grief counselor at the health signs, for example, yeah. what would be a recommendation for? that professional um, oversight or someone with a guiding principle that is going to look at the long-term benefits of grieving in a healthy way? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess when we look at a more of a formal counseling session, one of the first things we do as psychologists, and I know as like social workers and nurse practitioners, there's, we all have similar sort of ethical standards, and yeah. we make sure that um, a client understands before we even begin that the therapeutic process can actually be a difficult one. Mm-hmm. It's not, uh, you feel better. Right. In fact, oftentimes you might have a client walk out the door feeling worse. And it's really important that you uh, let them know that that could happen Mm -hmm. and make sure you actually get their consent for that. Something like grief work especially, that's a really normal process. And it needs to happen. People need to feel sad. They need to feel angry, irritated, frustrated, whatever the feeling might be that goes with grief. And seeing a psychologist or a counselor right away can not necessarily be the right answer for everyone, okay. especially because it might be sending them the message right. that we need you to get better, we need you to work right. therapeutically through to this long term, blah, blah, blah. Right. It's not. Right. So grief itself is not a disorder. It's not a problem. In fact, it's a necessary, I'm not going to say necessary evil, but it's a it necessary is. thing you have to It means through. you cared at some point. Exactly, yeah. And so I guess coming back to the idea of what do you do if you don't have those formal supports to help you, say say the grief has gone on longer than maybe it ideally would or should. Maybe it's affecting your functioning. Mm -hmm. Maybe you feel like, okay, I feel like I'm out of control now and this is not healthy. In that case, you know, family and loved ones, their common sense and their instinct might be to try to make you feel better. So they're there, here's a cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with a cup of tea. No, absolutely um, not. <laughs> maybe if they're offering you your fifth beer, there's a problem there. And, and maybe if it's a shots, Kleenex, two shots. And tissue, and sure, or their <laughs> tranquilizer, or whatever leftover prescription they have, that's a problem. Right. That's not so good. Right. Um, <laughs> and in that case, yeah, we need to stop looking just at the short term and right. start saying, well, you know what, maybe even as a loved one, even as a friend, maybe there's someone who has the capacity that they can offer you something a little bit different. Right. And by a little bit different, I mean someone who can maybe sit with you with your grief. Okay. They can help kind of bear witness. They can sort of hold that emotion with you. They can let you express it, not cut you off. And that's where the act of true listening comes in. Listening versus fixing. You use the phrase with me, um, silencing, Mm -hmm. that people um, silence each other. Can you tell me about that? I think silencing happens a lot of different ways. And I've used the word disenfranchised grief before. So it definitely applies in that case. Sometimes when we don't want to hear what someone has to say, or maybe it's not so much that we don't want to hear it, but we feel like we can't. Maybe we can't handle it. Maybe we don't want to handle it right now. Maybe we don't want to be responsible for following up with what it means and the repercussions. Then there might be different ways we go about shutting that person down. And sometimes it's completely unintentional. 
In fact, I like to think, especially when it comes to grief work, that it's completely unintentional. So silencing happens when someone cuts in with a platitude and says, they're there. Well, or yeah, actually anything that starts with the phrase, well, <laughs> well now, <laughs> you take care. Um, you know, I'll be thinking of you. Yeah. These are not bad things to say, but sometimes they can cut the conversation off in the moment. So yeah. those are kind of like the the little moment mechanical things. Yeah. But silencing itself, I think, is a bigger thing. And that's more the not leaving a, a place that someone can be sad in, um, making it unacceptable socially to cry, mm-hmm. um, making it clear that your expectations for the family get together is that everyone's going to be smiling and happy, um, that if you're off crying in the corner, you're somehow making others uncomfortable. Or, or you should have stayed home. Yourself. You should have stayed or home you if you're going to cry. Home. That's right. Or if like, it's too hard, you should stay it's home. It's going to be hard on the children. They shouldn't see you like this. And yeah, that that's pretty effective at silencing it. You mentioned children. Mm-hmm. What's your experience been with um, children who experience these? Like when when a loss happens in a family, for example, do you? Um, what's your thought on letting the kids, letting other children see that grief happen instead of hiding it from them? Does that does that ruin them? <laughs> does that scar them for life? So the reason <laughs> I, I look like I'm giggling on um, totally inappropriately <laughs> is because there's no such thing as hiding it from kids. Kids are not stupid. They might not have the same, uh, I don't know, social... I don't know, smoothness that we adults have, and they might not have the vocabulary for it, but they pick up on stuff. They know that mom or dad or family member is short-tempered. They know that they're sleeping more. Mm -hmm. They know that they're maybe not showering as often. Maybe they're not putting on their makeup and going out with their friends. Maybe they're just not as fun. They don't want to do stuff. They're not lighthearted. Who knows? Maybe right. they're faking it more. Maybe they're using a substance that they shouldn't be doing. I don't know. Right. There's they a whole know something's yeah. different. And that can be really confusing. So, in fact, one of my go-to things that I do recommend when there's children involved is that there is an open conversation and ongoing open communication mm-hmm. about grief so that kids aren't confused. They don't think it's something they did. They're not scared. They're not worried that mom and dad are maybe, you know, or mom and mom or dad and dad are yeah. going to split up. They're right. not worried, <clears throat> like, are we losing the house? Right. Are we going to have to move? They might have all kinds of thoughts going through their head. Right. And unfortunately, kids are really creative, They're really <laughs> yeah. imaginative. So right. they can imagine the worst possible thing. Right. And it's so, far better for them to see mom or dad cry and then show, look, mom's crying. And yet, there's still a roof over your head. We're still going to put supper on the table. Yep. We're still going to go to school the next day yep. or work or get the groceries. You know, sadness is, it's hard. Mm-hmm. And what we do for that is we support each other. We hug each other. We talk it out. And it takes time. And it's okay. Eventually, it might get a little bit better. That's right. It, it seems to add an extra level to grief, to pretend everything's okay, mm-hmm. to keep up appearances for other people who are uncomfortable, and even family members. It's It seems like it would push your grief down further and make it that much harder to deal with. Disenfranchising if you... grief like that, like not being allowed to ex- express it, yeah. can lead to so many more problems. Mm-hmm. We feel guilt. We feel guilty that we're making other people uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but then we feel guilty that we're not mourning more openly. Then we feel like, oh my gosh, maybe I've forgotten him or her. Mm-hmm. And then there's the shame part. And then we start thinking about, oh, our gender. Well, I'm acting too much like a woman, or I'm not feminine enough. I'm a, I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad wife. I'm a, or father or husband, like whatever your role might right. be. There's so much stuff that gets messed up in there. And then because grief does cause so many other things to be happening, like, say, lack of concentration, difficulty remembering things, right. irritability, difficulty right. sleeping. You are more tired, so you need more sleep, but you're also not going to be as productive as normal. Right. Then we start to judge ourselves and think, oh, I'm a bad worker. I'm doing poorly. Right. We get more anxious, and it becomes this awful cycle. Right. So what happens, what's the time, I know there's no timeline exactly, and there's, are there five stages of grief? Is that a real thing? Or is there well, <laughs> I don't like the word stage because it sort of suggests that right. it's uh, this separate thing. Right. And 
<laughs> personally, I can go from anger to sadness to back sort to of acceptance <laughs> and then back to the anger. Right. And, and I think most people are probably like that. So there might be five major labels that might sure. happen throughout the roller coaster. Yeah, they're themes. Themes. Yeah. And okay. you hope that some of the themes become more prominent right. as you move through this roller coaster. Right. I think one of the scary things is that when you're in that depth of despair, that it feels like it's permanent yes. and it's never going to end and this is your new normal. And when you look around and look at cues around you, like, well, things are different. This mm -hmm. person isn't around. This baby was supposed to be here and now, it, now he or she isn't. Mm -hmm. it's, there's, it's really hard to see that there's a light anywhere in, in your near future. What do you tell people that come in and they just figure, I mean, obviously, there is an option to end it. That's, I know that goes yeah. through a lot of people's mind when they've lost someone that's very yeah. close to them. Um, when you choose to keep on going, what, what do you tell people to keep them hopeful? Hmm. You touched on a lot of things <laughs> there, so I guess um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch we on the time. important We have lots of time. We have lots of time. Sure. I guess one of the big things that jumped out at me when you're, you're saying that was, um, of course, the risk of suicide. Yeah. We're really scared about even using that word. And often, you know, even as a psychologist, sometimes yeah. my gut instinct is to kind of tiptoe around it a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about hurting yourself or hurting someone else. Right. No, I'm talking about suicide or homicide. Right. right. And I'm not necessarily going to get graphic with details. And it's at the same time, it's really good to be very frank. And Absolutely. People get really uncomfortable about anything that's sort of taboo socially. Yep. Yeah. And unfortunately, we know one in 26 people does think about suicide at some point in their life. I would wager to guess that uh, people who've, I, and I'm only coming from a um, loss and stillbirths perspective, mm -hmm. but I remember sitting in grief support groups where every single person at the table said, yep, I've thought about driving my car into a, a brick wall or into yeah. oncoming traffic. Um, and what I find interesting about people who don't want to talk about suicide, mm -hmm. it is always an option. Yes. It's an, for the most part, from teenagers and young people is a different thing, but it is an option for an adult. It's mm -hmm. yes, it will make people sad, but sometimes that is the only way out. That's like it can feel like that. It can certainly feel like that is an option. And choosing, I mean, we hope that you would choose to stick around, but that is an option that would make that pain stop. And t taking that to say that well, it will hurt people if you kill yourself. Yeah. Right, but people in those in that brain space are not concerned about anybody else's feelings. They want their pain to stop. It's not a, a, a I know there's a stigma that it must have been very selfish of that person. They didn't think of the people. If, yeah, exactly. They weren't thinking of people they were going to leave behind because they were in so much pain. And to appreciate what somebody is going through, you have to acknowledge that's some pretty serious pain that they're going through. And if you really want to help, there are ways to help. Silencing somebody, telling them they're in a better place mm -hmm. or my favorite is I'll pray for you that's fantastic but if you could also drop over sometimes and you know bring some cookies yeah. let me talk about the person that we lost let's acknowledge that, that person isn't here anymore seems to be there are ways you can help there are there are ways you can reach out to somebody who might be feeling like hurting themselves is the only way out so I wanted to I just wanted to touch on that for just a moment because I feel like that's one thing that people don't really talk about openly and when it's hidden it has a ch uh, an opportunity to fester and you feel selfish and guilt and you feel all these other things and I don't feel like there's a way out this grief is never going to end and talking about these taboo subjects mm -hmm is the best way to lance those wounds and let it out. And maybe that's uncomfortable for people, but it's okay for people to feel uncomfortable. I mean, in your expert opinion, how are you with uncomfortable and sad feelings and all those things? Like, what's the, uh, do they hurt <laughs> in the long term? Being a fellow human, uh, discomfort and sadness is uncomfortable and sad. <clears throat> However, <laughs> there is an end goal in mind. Yeah. And I think um, unless we get better and better at learning how to cope and handle those and allow ourselves and give ourselves permission and mm -hmm. give other people permission to feel real feelings yeah. we never really learn right and you know I just even want to come back to some of the things you were saying yeah. before you know when people talk about suicide it doesn't come out of nowhere it can come from a mental health place it can mm -hmm. come from someone who unfortunately um, maybe their mood maybe had a mood disorder that was so severe that they had lost all hope. Right. 
Additionally, there can be certain situations where people can lose all hope. Mm -hmm. And you could make an argument that somehow it's sort of correlated with mood and sort of how you look at the world and that kind of thing too. Mm -hmm. But I think it comes back to that hope idea again. And I think that's one of the reasons why in in mental health and in fact in a lot of medical health uh, fields, we do suicide intervention. And it's not suicide prevention necessarily. What it is, it's an emergency first aid Mm -hmm. kind of uh, intervention so that when there is an opening, when someone's made some sort of hint or they left a crack, you know, that's that's where the light gets in, huh? Um, In that case, then, we figure out where the crack is and we figure out with them what they want to do. Right. Maybe, Maybe in the long run, they will decide to end their life. Yeah. I mean, I hope not. Right. But you're right. As an adult, there are a lot of really difficult decisions. Yeah. And the best thing you can do is help someone hold on long enough that they completely, completely go through every possible resource, right. all the possibilities, all the chances for hope, mm-hmm. all the alternatives, all the options, the solutions, the possibilities. And, you know, in my experience, that's, that's going to be what it takes. It must be very hard to hold people's hands through those experiences, to have people sit in your office who have lost a baby through um, at very young age or through stillbirth or even infertility. Mm -hmm. Families who go through infertility, who go through fertility treatments that are not not successful, I can't imagine how much grief they have when they've lost multiple. So complicated. It really is the ultimate in disenfranchised yeah. grief. Yeah. You know, it is horrible to lose a baby that you're carrying in your own body. Mm-hmm. The amount of guilt and shame and self-recrimination and thinking I'm a bad person. I did something somehow. Must have. I mean, literally. Absolutely. It's our body or vessel. Yep. How, what did I do? Right. Maybe that thought I had when I was 16 or that one cigarette I tried. You never know. Absolutely. Like everything goes through your head. Yeah. But for someone that doesn't even get to the point of having that living being, right. it's so confusing. It's it's. Yeah, it's the exact definition of disenfranchised grief. Right. You didn't even get to create memories of finding out you're pregnant. Right. So, Sarah, we've talked about what it's like possibly for someone who has experience, and we're specifically talking about stillbirth and loss in in that realm of babies and fertility. Um, How does the partner who's not carrying the baby get to carve out some space for themselves to grieve. I, I know the focus, you know, a, a really good partner is going to be there for you and all these other things, but they must have some grief as well. That how do they possibly become, take care of themselves enough to, to mm-hmm. grieve and let that happen? Well, first off, I think it is really important to actually acknowledge that they absolutely are grieving. Mm-hmm. And grief that's happening for a partner especially is going to be complicated Mm -hmm. because they don't have memories made with this little one. They don't have the experience maybe of feeling the flutters in their belly and they might feel very, very responsible or the opposite. They might feel so out of control like there's nothing they can do. It can be really hard on a relationship and it can be hard on an intimate relationship. It can also be hard on a parent or even an in-law relationship to, to... grown up children Mm -hmm. because we we do want to be able to help each other we feel like we should somehow magically know what to say what to do Mm -hmm. and we definitely want to be able to swoop in and make it all better right but unfortunately there are a lot of limits to making things better and then add to that there's the complication like i said men and women are going to experience different things Mm -hmm. so um Two men uh, trying to have a baby, maybe with a surrogate, mm-hmm. maybe with uh, a woman. They're going to have a really different experience. There can be guilt involved. They might be thinking, "I should have gone with someone younger. Maybe I should have. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe this is unethical. Maybe right. maybe this is exactly. We should have more of it." I don't know. Two women going through it might be thinking all, all sorts of very similar things. They might think, yeah. "Maybe I should use my own egg, and the, maybe I shouldn't be carrying my partner's. Maybe they." Who there's knows? lots of maybes. Oh my gosh! There's sky's the limit and honestly the only thing that differs for the individual is their individual circumstance Uh, we don't always know what it is that causes a stillbirth or miscarriage in fact we often don't right and the very fact that it's so frequent you know and some people will say one in five 
Some people will say more, some three. people will say fewer. Absolutely. Yeah. And the trouble is we're getting better and better at detecting a really early pregnancy. You know, maybe that's a problem. It's great for the people that really, really want to know right Who away. might only get a couple of weeks with their baby. That's right. Absolutely. And I like that you're able to say that because there is something absolutely beautiful about being able to treasure every, every second moment. second of knowing that you're pregnant. As soon as you know you're pregnant, you are a parent. When, That's when you exactly accept it. that pregnancy yeah. and you want to have that baby, absolutely. Yeah. That's one thing every that all those scenarios that you mentioned, parent. whether whether it's two men or two women or yeah. whatever the scenario is, when you see that positive pregnancy test, something changes. You look at the calendar and you see Christmas looks different. Easter's mm-hmm. going to look different this year. I can't go to the regatta because it'll be too hot. Or yeah. you you start making planes the moment you mm-hmm. expect to become a parent. Mm-hmm. And, and I there's think good and there's bad. And when it goes That's wrong, confusing. when it when it doesn't work out, Mm -hmm. I think you grieve every single hopeful dream that you had. And that takes a lot of time. So that's the first Christmas is really hard, the first birthday, the Mm -hmm. first anniversary of the day you found out you were pregnant, the first anniversary of your first fertility treatment, the day that you went to Oshkosh and you bought a a jumper. Mm -hmm. It's every single thing that you, every moment that you anticipated, you don't get that anymore. That's a lot of, that's a lot of grieving. And that can be uncomfortable for people to, very much, you know. And it's not even just the grief of, of the baby and hoping to have the baby and all the dreams you have for their life. It's also the grief of the role. A lot of us as women, especially, you know, right from being a little baby, being a little girl, we might be encouraged to dress up little dolls and like, Mm -hmm. you're going to be such a good mom when you grow up. A lot of us might imagine being a parent and grandparents can absolutely have such a sense of loss. And, and likewise, you know, even aunts and wives, uh, sorry, and, and friends and mm. like other family members. Tell me about grandparents. Have you had anyone, have you had an experience with grandparents who feel connected to the babies that have been lost? Oh, definitely. Okay. Absolutely. It can get really complicated, actually. Or they might feel that it's actually more important that they support their loved one mm-hmm. rather than go through their own grief. Right. And that's pretty common. Uh, there might be kind of like this censorship, this uh, filter that you're putting on everything you say. Mm-hmm. Some of us, in fact, a lot of us, we want to be overly cautious. We don't want to be the trigger for our daughter-in-law to suddenly remember, oh, that's right, I was pregnant three weeks ago or three years ago. And yet none of us, aside from the obvious triggers like Mother's Day, um, none of us can predict every single trigger. It's funny that you mention the word trigger because yeah. I've had a few people in my lifetime say, I didn't want to remind you. Mm. I can tell you without, unequivocally, I never forget.